perfect. So uh, those of you that come here kind of week by week will know that we are um, we're studying uh, John's gospel, and really we're studying John's gospel for a, for a few reasons. Uh, the first is uh, it's always great to really dig into the life of Jesus, to understand uh, what Jesus um, says about himself, uh, the way that he's presented, the way that he interacts with real people in the real world, and understand a little bit more about our Savior. But the second thing we understand about about the Gospel of John is that it's kind of slow media. I've been thinking a lot this week about, about the fact the medium is the message. That's a kind of famous, uh, a famous phrase. My friend Megan was away with some Instagram influencers for reasons best known to herself, um, away on holiday a couple of weeks ago. And talking to her when she came back, kind of asking her how the holiday was, she was telling me she, it was really weird because folks who use Instagram literally for a living, that's a photograph app where you can share your photos with the world. Um, see Adrian Smith, a good follow. Um, uh, but people who, people who do it for a living, she said, you know, the, the problem with going on holiday with them was it that they had stopped appreciating the world for what it was, an enjoyable experience, and just started seeing the photograph opportunity in everything. The way that we view the world, the way that we look, what we look at the world through, sorry, have I set off a domestic disagreement there? So I do apologize. Um, you always do that, yeah, sorry. Um, the way we view the world, the lenses th through which we view the world, and that's becoming increasingly apparent in social media space. If you're an Instagram person, you view the world as a series of photo opportunities. If you're a Twitter person, you view the world in 140 character bumper stickers and engage constantly in arguments with other people. If you're a Facebook person, I mean, goodness knows, um, you, you look to kind of relate to other folks in tribes and draw circles around people. And I, it's becoming increasingly clear to me that the, the book of John speaks to us in our, in our present age because it's slow and deliberate. It weaves themes and it brings things out. And I personally have found that as I step through John, as I've engaged with it, as I've tried to bring sermons out of it, that slowness has been helpful for me. And actually, I begin to see the world through a bit of a Bible lens. And that's a really helpful, healthy, happy thing. And I'd, I'd encourage you in that as well. That's, that's just a starter. So, John's gospel is somewhat different from the other three gospels. It's got distinct themes and structures, and we've been bringing those out. Um, the themes, kind of things, things to think about and things we'll see here. The first is, compared to the other gospels, Jesus isn't hidden. He's a bit of a mystery figure in, in the first three, but in the gospel of John, Jesus is pretty clear about who he is from the start. And these I am statements that we're, that we're using to kind of string along, string this series of ser seven sermons together are good kind of evidence and pointers to that. He's very clear about who he is, that he's the, he's the son of God, the savior of the world. The, uh, the Gospel of John's highly structured. It's this big narrative structure. Um, Tim Mackey, the, the um, Bible Project um, kind of founder, co-founder, um, says that in the other Gospels, Jesus is a stand-up comedian full of one-liners, but in the Gospel of John, he's a university professor. He's, he's giving full kind of depth and, and, and speech. Um, so it's that, that highly structured. It's really hard to kind of rip 10 verses out of context, although this morning I'm going to try. Um, the, other, the other Gospels, the, the proper uh, Greek word is periok periop nope. periokopy, which is, which is a word for like a, a small, punchy, 10-verse, like a, a miracle or a parable, the way those other Gospels are arranged. And John is really not arranged like that. And then the, the, the kind of third and final thing that I want to draw your attention to before we start is John is always completely clear about his purpose. These are the verses we used right at the start of this series to arrange ourselves. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There's no mystery there what John is, what John is trying to do. And these seven I am statements that we're looking at 
do all of these things for us. They make Jesus clear to us. They help, they help us structure, and, they, and they're kind of thematic. They run through, and they're also building towards that theme. They're building towards the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. They give depth and give kind of um, richness to what it means that Jesus is the Messiah. So, let's, instead of ripping 10 verses out of context, let's try and, and, and lay them in the story. So, we're in John 10. So, if you want to open up your Bible to John 10 so that we're we're ready, and I'll just give you the kind of narrative before and after. The narrative in the book of John kind of builds up to the high point in, in chapter 11 when uh, Jesus raises Lazarus for the dead and then, and then kind of rapidly moves towards the end, towards Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection. And if you imagine it like a big, um, like a big arch like that, it, um, that, that's a good way of doing it. And here in John 10, we're about the middle point. Um, I thoroughly recommend that you go away and read chapter 9 yourself. It's one of my absolute favorite uh, stories in the whole of the New Testament. Jesus heals a man born blind, um, and uh, he heals, I think, possibly the sassiest man born blind in the, in the history of things. Uh, that guy's discourse with the Pharisees is well worth looking into. It's got sarcasm. It's got bite. It's got all kinds of humor. You'll really enjoy it. And then Jesus and that man get into an argument with the Pharisees about the healing of the blind person. And then Jesus talks about spiritual blindness. And it's one of these places in John where you get re this really nice uh, mix of miracle and theme and uh, story all operating together th that it becomes clear that, the, that Jesus tells the Pharisees that they're more blind than the man who was born blind. And he can now see and they still can't see. And it's, it's great. It's it's a proper, you know, episode of premium television in a chapter of the Bible. Um, then we have this passage that we're looking at today, which is a set of stories about sheep and shepherds. And then after this, Jesus goes back to arguing with the set of religious Jews. And really, the point, the point I'm making here is this story sits in the middle of two bits of conflict. Jesus' conflict with um, the religious leaders this time is just growing and growing and growing across the whole of that first half of John, and we're in a bit of really kind of intense conflict here. So this, th this set of verses that we're looking at kind of does two or three things. The first is it sits as a story by itself, and we'll be looking at it in kind of that today. The second is it sets, it sets us up as a kind of um, argument or bit of discussion that Jesus is having with the leaders of his time, and there's definitely themes in there, in there that we'll draw out, but it's also this kind of this kind of plank in the, in the bridge that's taking us up towards uh, Jesus' uh, death and, and resurrection that are right at the end of the book. And all of those things are in there. Um, one of the things about being a Christian for a while is that you become kind of a, a, a bit of a sort of pseudo-expert in a, a couple of weird things like uh, vineyard pressing, like uh, sheep rearing. Um, you just kind of build up this kind of general knowledge about first century Bronze Age techniques. Um, and one of the things I think we're all in is this kind of shepherd image. The Bible is stuffed full of shepherd images. Uh, we're not talking about shepherd images. That's next week with Keith Short. Um, and uh, I'm not jealous that he's got the good shepherd, but I am a bit jealous because, yeah. Um, but just so that we're all, before I, I kind of read you the passage, here's the image that Jesus presents, because it's a, a very familiar to his first century audience, much less familiar to us. Sheep are everywhere in that first century Palestinian context. Um, the flocks kind of roam about the hillside, and then maybe at night, or maybe for counting, they get pushed into a pen that looks like this. The pen is a wall, kind of rough stone wall, very often with thorns on top, and the shepherd herds the sheep in there, and then there's sometimes a gate and sometimes not, um, and that's basically how you do sheep penning. That's an important image for you to have in your head because I'm about to read you the passage. So let's go. Uh, John 10, verses, verses 1 to 10. If you have it, follow along. If not, I'll read it. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So, here we go. This, this, is, a, this is a sheep just in case you weren't clear what a sheep was. This is a photo of a sheep that I took on holiday in Northumberland. Basically, if somebody does a bit of preaching on the side and you spray paint 99 on the side of one of your sheep, I will definitely take a photo of it on the basis that it will definitely come up in a sermon at, at, at some stage. But I'm just going to pick out two or three things from the passage that are kind of points of interest, and then we'll get into discussing it. So first... Uh, this, I tell you the truth. So it appears in verse 1 and then again in in verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. This is a really important uh, word construction in John. I try and stay away from individual words, but this is worth bearing at any time you see. This is the NIV, and it says, I tell you the truth. But what it's translating there is a a two-word phrase, amen, amen. Amen, as we know, is how we, how we finish prayers. It's originally a Hebrew word uh, that means uh, truly or truthfully, and that's why we say at the end of the prayer, it's like, I agree, that's true, I, uh, it's true for me. In John in particular, Jesus uses this, this kind of, uses it in this very distinct way. Amen, amen. It's translated, the NIV, the, this New International Version that I'm reading out of, translates it, I tell you the truth from the Greek. My favorite is the New English Bible, which translates it in truth, in very truth, which I, which I enjoy immensely. Some uh, other translations leave it as amen, amen. But the, the, G- Jesus uses it when he's talking to people as a point of emphasis. I don't know if you've ever had any exposure to uh, folks from the armed forces. Um, they would use the phrase, listen in, in very much the same fashion. I don't know if you ever worked with them or been around folks from the armed forces, they'll say, all right, guys, listen in. And that's very much, that's very much what Jesus is doing here. Pay attention. I'm going to say something significant. So he does it, he does it twice here. And any other time, you, you know, as people unpick John for you, watch out, look out for I tell you the truth. It means Jesus is going to say something uh, significant or spiky. V- verse 6, I find really interesting. Uh, Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what, they, what he was telling them. One of the interesting things about John, as compared to the other uh, Gospels, is that it doesn't have any parables in it. So, the impression we get of Jesus from Matthew, Mark, and Luke is that that Jesus goes around telling stories. He engages the crowds, crowds around them, and you know many people's favorite bits of the Bible are you know, the story of the prodigal son, the story of the lost sheep, um, wherever, wherever we're going with that. John contains no parables, uh, no parables at all. And uh, here, you know, Jesus is talking about, is using a figure of speech. And lots and lots of people have tried to kind of reconstruct the original parable that sits underneath, this kind of assumption that there must be a parable underneath. And, um, you know, John's con- conclusion that they did not understand what he was telling them, having spent probably an hour and a half this week in various commentaries and other sources and academic literature, I, I, th- I think what I'd say on balance is um, nobody really understands exactly uh, what's being tried, tried to say here. It doesn't mean we can't get value out of it. But, um, this is not a parable in the classical sense. And if you try and read it and understand it like a parable, I don't think you're going to get the best out of it. I mean, apart from anything else, in verses 1 to 6, it seems pretty clear that Jesus is the shepherd. In verses 7 to 10, he suddenly becomes the gate. And in verses 11 to 18, he becomes the shepherd again. And you get lots of people saying, you know, the shepherd would lie across the front of that pen at night to to protect the sheep. He becomes the gate, and I don't know, it just, 
the, the general feel you get is that Jesus is using an image, and he's using an image to explain who he is. And like any image, that image is only partially true, and therefore we need to kind of read it and, and deal with it and kind of ingest it and take the, take the things that are, are, are true. So it's, it's an image in which Jesus uses and then takes in two directions. In the first direction, he's the gate, and he has these kind of qualities associated with the gate, and that's what we're talking about this week. And then in some other bits of this image, Jesus is the shepherd and has the qualities of a shepherd, the kind of ultimate shepherd, and that's what Keith's going to talk about uh, next week. So just kind of there, just be careful about how, how we're reading it, or, or, or not, try and, not try and torture the metaphor to death, I suppose, is, is, is what I'm saying. So, here we go. Uh, let's, let, let's, let's dig into it. That's the, that's the kind of text issues, but let's have a look at what Jesus is saying. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate through me you will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to st steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. There's two really clear things we, we pull from that. What does it mean for Jesus to be the gate? It signifies two things for the sheep. The first super clear from verse 9, the sheep are saved they're saved. They are saved from threat. They find good pasture. And then in verse 10, they have life and they have it to the full. I think there are two halves to that, two really important halves that don't, that don't come out unless we, uh, we, we, kind of, we use them. How do we talk about what Jesus gives us? How do we explain it to other people and how we think about it themselves? Uh, sorry, ourselves. I think, I think there, are, there are two parts in this gate picture. The first is Jesus gives us both eternal life and also present existence, life for now as well as life for yet to come. And then the second thing is Jesus is our means of salvation, but also a space for full flourishing in life. I've got the potential to get myself into real trouble here because any time I stand up here and talk about generational differences, differences between generations, I manage to offend almost everybody uh, who, who's sitting, sitting here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just maybe be a bit fuzzy about it. I'm going to talk about Disney princesses. So some of you some of you will have grown up with a specific set of Disney princesses. Your Snow Whites, uh, your Sleeping Beauties, your Cinderella's. Those Disney princesses, those Disney princesses are perhaps more traditional. Their kind of theme song is, someday my prince will come. Other ones of you will have grown up with a different set of Disney princesses. Your Little Mermaids, your Jasmines, your Mulans, your Elsas. Their theme song is let it go, let it go, turn away and slam the door. There's just a different, a different vibe between the two sets of Disney princesses there. I, we could call them modern and postmodern Disney princesses, perhaps. The theologian, uh, theologian Leslie Newbiggin, who's amazing, get into his work, they're fabulous. Leslie Newbiggin was a, uh, a, a British guy who went to be a missionary in India in 1936. So he, he trained and went to be a missionary in India in 1936. He spent 40 years in India and came back to the UK in 1974 and he found it almost completely changed. And lots of his latter writings were about how he trained and trained to do cross-cultural ministry to India in 1936, but then came back to the UK in 1974, expecting to find it the same place, and needed the same depth of cultural training to translate for British people in the 1970s as he did for Indian people in the 1930s. What am I, what am I talking about? There are, 
there are, there are a couple of things here. In that period in the UK, we've gone from a place, a, a modern place, where people were broadly taught to be good and therefore pointing out to them that they weren't as good as they thought they were and they needed a savior in Jesus was a very effective way to communicate the gospel to them. In our postmodern world, generally, people are not taught to be good. They are taught to be themselves. And therefore, pointing out that they are not good doesn't make much sense, that they need a savior makes even less sense. And we sometimes struggle to communicate in that context. So, how do, we, how do we deal with that when we talk about Jesus as the gate? Well, these five points round, round in the circle are drawn, I, I will always, uh, I, I'll always steal from Tim Keller because he's excellent to steal from, but they're drawn from a series of Tim Keller talks that actually the way we talk to people about life in the fullness, fullness of life, Life should have meaning, life should have identity, life should have satisfaction, life should have freedom, and life should have hope. When we talk about having life and having it to the full, we can touch on any of those five things and talk about how a relationship with God, about going through the gate into full life, into pasture, through Jesus, can bring you any one of those five things. And by drawing distinction, between the life that the world offers in meaning and identity and satisfaction and freedom and in hope, we can, we can build a, an understanding that people need Jesus, even if they maybe don't recognize that they themselves uh, are, are, are sinful. And we can use that as a bridge into their lives. So before I lose chunks of folk, let me, let me talk about what that mean, might mean for, for, for two points. just on identity and on satisfaction. We could have done this with any of the five, but I think identity and satisfaction are, 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 are the ones to pick up. When we're talking to people who are non-Christians or when we're understanding ourselves and thinking about how we relate into our culture, how do we make sure we are using um, the Bible as our lens and not Twitter or Instagram or, 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 or whatever? How do we use the Bible as a lens to understand what we're looking for? The world, the world gives us two possible sources of identity. We can draw identity from ourselves or draw identity from our roles. So we get back to the Disney princesses. Snow White and Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty very much draw identity from their roles, from being princesses. And if they can only find a better way to be a princess or find a prince to love them, they will have an identity and they will have value. Those latter princesses, the Little Mermaid, I know she's called Ariel, but Jasmine, Mulan, and Elsa need to draw identity from themselves. They need to be themselves and find out who they are, and then they will be happy, and they will explode the role that they're being crammed into. And our Western mindset says, yep, that, that's the way to do it. Interestingly, traditional culture, we do a bit of work with, with uh, some Korean folks who put their surname first. So their first, the first name that appears in their name is, is a surname. And for me, that helps to understand that they are culturally a bit different from we are. Like that role, that family culture, that's what they emphasize first, and then their personal name comes afterwards. This is by no means kind of universal around the world, but it's probably true for where we are in the West right now, that people draw identity from being themselves, from finding out who their authentic self is, from pushing that authentic self in the world. Any, anyone who's ever told you, don't do it for me, do it for yourself, that's a very modern Western approach uh, to identity. The problem is, the problem is that both drawing your identity from yourself or drawing your identity from the role from who you are have the potential to be crushing. They have the potential to be absolutely crushing. Drawing your identity from your role, perhaps most obviously, if you don't fulfill your role, or you break down, or you want to change role, that's, that's a real problem. And even more so, 
if, if you, you draw your identity from a true knowledge of who you are, from expressing your real self, well, what happens if you don't know who that is? What if you let yourself down? What if ill health or mental health problems start to pull up that sense of identity? What happens? You have the real unraveling of, your, of yourself as a human being. And actually, in this passage, it's quite clear. This passage tells us who we are. We are sheep. And that's anyone, whoever draws comfort from the Lord is my shepherd doesn't understand the depth to which they're being insulted by being referred to as a sheep. Like, a sheep is not a particularly um, edifying uh, metaphor for, for us as human beings. Sheep go astray. They're very foolish. They wander off cliffs and into rivers. Um, so, understanding who, who you are, but the, the passage is really clear. You've been named. You are a sheep that has been named and then has been saved and redeemed. And that's a really, as a starting point for identity, that's much more profound and powerful than yourself or your role. And then let's talk about satisfaction. I'm at a funny age in life, I'm 39, um, but I'm very much at an age where my peers are starting to struggle with satisfaction. Lots of them are getting to a point in their career where it's quite clear that that's not going to pan out for them. They are not going to get the top paid, high flying job that they had in mind when they graduated. Quite a lot of my peers are getting to places in their marriage or their long term relationship where either they, they don't have the relationship they thought they would have or that relationship is beginning to run out of steam a little bit. And if we look at what the world tells us about satisfaction, the world tells us that whether we get our desires or not is the defining measure of our satisfaction. Whether you achieve or you don't achieve and your relationship to that achievement is the, is the mark of your success and satisfaction. St. Augustine talks about disordered loves, and that's very much the, the space that we're, we're kind of entering in here. Jesus sets himself up as the gate to a satisfying life. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What does he, what does he mean by that? St. Augustine says, loves are not the problem. Wanting things is not the problem. Your desires are part of what it means to be human, not, not something to be kind of you know, push, pushed away or, or fully embraced. The problem is that your desires are disordered. So if you love your work more than your family, that will be disastrous for your life, for your family. That's pretty obvious. If you love your kids more than you love God, you will crush your kids with your expectations and you will misunderstand they will misunderstand who, who God is for them. Ordering your desires with, with God as the, as the key focus of your life is the, way to, is the way to satisfaction. And that doesn't just mean squeezing and squeezing and squeezing and saying, I must love God more, I must, I must love God more. It's, um, it's about what understanding what it means that Jesus is, is the gate. So there's a long history to this kind of image of the gate in the Old Testament and then into the New, but it's really interesting for me about what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, like with any of these I am exp expressions, that there is a gate or I can show you the gate. I am the gate is a very different kind of promise. Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't show us how to live. Doesn't, Jesus doesn't just show us how to live. He gives us the solution for us not living like that. He doesn't just tell us to work harder and love better. He gives us the solution to that. And like the whole of the book of John, 
it points towards the, the cross and resurrection. So this verse from Hebrews, which also mentions a gate, Jesus, like the Passover lambs, is sacrificed outside of the gate of the city, which is a kind of big, a big image, to make the people holy through his own blood. We do not, we do not worship a God who exists in, in absence and gives us rules or gives us um, laws in order to make us good. We follow a Savior who we worship, who through worshiping will change what we are inside because He becomes the lens through which we see the world. So, how do we pick it up? That was maybe, maybe my confusion with the passage is, is presented. So, as always, three, three questions. Three questions. One on how we, how we talk about Jesus, how we present Jesus to other people. Jesus offers us a, a life for now as well as salvation in eternity. So, when we talk to our friends about the life that Jesus brings, are we doing that? Are we making Jesus just the means to an end, the means to eternal life in the future yet to come, or are we making Him the, the journey and the gate for a full life that starts now? In terms of that full life, Jesus, presented in John as the Son of God, presented as the Savior of the world, speaks to our life's meaning, our life's identity, our life's satisfaction, the freedom and hope that we have. I get the feeling that we all struggle with, with one of those. Ask Jesus to help you with that. Ask Jesus to, to, to get inside with His Spirit and show you what that is. Mine, <laughs> for me, Hope is the one I struggle with most often. I get myself tied in academic knots and uh, fancy theories, and I struggle with an eternal hope. But actually, it's the, it's the other things for now that, that pull me back to that. And then, what does it mean to be a gated community, a community that's entered through the gate that is Jesus, not a gate that keeps out God doesn't offer us laws or methods or processes or rules, but His Son, Jesus. His I am statements illuminate what that gift means, illuminate what that gift means. How does our community reflect that? Does it reflect it with the rules or with our worship? Do we place rules, additional rules on people, or do we allow them freedom to worship uh, the God who's the gate? Lord God, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you that you communicate with us in a way that is rich and full of meaning because you're a God who is rich and full of meaning. I want to thank you that you sent your son, uh, Jesus, as a perfect expression of humanity, as God in human form, and that by coming and showing us how to live, live full and rich lives, He showed us what a solution for right now is, as well as a solution for all time and eternity. God, I pray that You, you complete the work that you, that you began in us when we became Christians. You begin to change us from the inside out. You don't allow us to be distracted by other ways of seeing the world. You don't allow us to get pulled aside by the world's view of us or that we take on what culture says about us, but that we'd understand who we are. We'd understand what our identity in you is. And Lord God, I pray that by understanding who you are and, how, and your satisfaction, the satisfaction you give us, we'd be able to recognize your other gifts for, for what they are. Gifts that can bring us joy, but are not our ultimate satisfaction. I pray that you'd allow us to order the other gifts that you give us in life properly and, and fully. 
uh, worshiping you as the giver of gifts. Lord God, I pray as we come into a time of communion that you'd place things on, on people's hearts that they need to bring to you. They need to, uh, they need to uh, talk to you about and need to receive your word about. Lord God, I pray that, that you'd come and be with us now in your spirit. Amen.